Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our monthly webinar series. This month, we'll be doing our legislative update. My name is Andrew Demers. I am the communications director here at the New Hampshire Insurance Department. If you have any questions during the webinar, we invite you to type them into the chat box. We'll be happy to answer them at the end of the presentation. I'm joined by our commissioner, DJ Betancourt, our deputy, Keith Nyan, our legislative director, Jennifer Smith, uh, and I believe we have our life and health director, and our property and casualty director joining us as well. So we appreciate you, and I'm happy to turn it over to Commissioner Betancourt. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. As Andrew mentioned, my name is DJ Betancourt. I have the pleasure of serving as the commissioner of the New Hampshire Insurance Department. A few years ago, we got an idea of hosting a webinar at legislative crossover time. And I'll explain what that means in just a moment, but it proved to be a big hit. And so we decided we were going to bring it back this year. For those of you who have followed any legislative action this year, you know it has been a very, very active season with a lot of significant, important pieces of legislation coming forward. The department has been actively involved in helping the legislature uh, work through these pieces of legislation, providing them with information, providing them with uh, new drafts of their proposals. Uh, there are some things that are moving forward that we're very, very excited about, and there are some things that are moving forward that are a little bit concerning to us. And so we're going to cover all of that this morning. So first, for those of you who are not familiar with the legislative nomenclature, so crossover is the point at which all of the bills that were passed by the House of Representatives move over to the Senate, the state Senate, and all of the bills that passed through the state Senate go over to the House of Representatives. For anybody who has watched the great cartoon, um, um, Schoolhouse Rock, you know how this process works. A bill has to pass both the House and the Senate and then ultimately be signed by the governor to become law. So we're at the halfway point. Being a sports person, I like to call it halftime. So we're at halftime of this legislative season. And again, we wanted to cover some of the more significant pieces of legislation that are currently under consideration by the legislature. So we've broken this up into two categories, first property and casualty, and second life and health. So we're gonna start with property and casualty. Unfortunately, I've got Deputy Commissioner Keith Nyan here and our head of our PNC division, James Fox, who can fill in any blanks that I miss. So the first one that we wanna highlight is House Bill 1259, relative to property and casualty insurance laws administered by the New Hampshire Insurance Department. So this is a house cleaning bill. It's a bill that the uh, department proposed to the legislature not a huge amount of substantive things going on, but we are cleaning up our statute. We're uh, updating our statute, making sure that the language uh, is up to date and where it needs to be, given all of the other changes that have taken place in insurance law over the past several years. Uh, beyond that, James, anything to highlight? Uh, no, I, th I, th I, th I think you nailed it, Commissioner. I mean, our, our goal is always to try to stay current. So I, I would just suggest if anybody else, uh, anybody out there thinks that we have a, a current uh, uh, statute that isn't kind of in step with the times, you should definitely contact us and we'll take a look at it. Thank you, James. Another highlight, another department initiative that we want to discuss is Senate Bill 515 relative to consumer guarantee contracts. We've talked a lot over the course of the last several months about consumer guarantee contracts and the concerns that the department has with them. A lot of the troubling trends that we have seen with these particular products and obviously some of the steps that we're taking to ensure that there is adequate consumer protection in place and that we are ensuring that the bad actors in this space are not allowed to uh, perpetrate um, unethical acts on our constituents. So uh, if you're interested in what consumer guarantee contracts are and what our concerns are with them that are now being addressed through Senate Bill 515, I encourage you to go back and take a look at one of our previous webinars that focuses exclusively on that issue. James, again, anything to add? You know, I, I would just add on this one, you know, Commissioner, that I, I think you deserve a lot of the credit for working extremely hard on a, on a, on a statute that's been around a long time to try to, to try to make it, uh, put more teeth in it to for the consumers. And I think you deserve a lot of credit. Well, thank you, James, I appreciate that. So 1259 uh, is a House bill, so that's going over to the Senate. Senate Bill 515, obviously a Senate bill that's going over to the House. Also in the property casualty space are some bills that concern us a bit. 
The first is Senate Bill 423, which is relative to mandatory disclosure of insurance policy limits. Now, let me say that that bill has been changed. It was changed recently. My understanding is that the state Senate brought forward a floor amendment um, just last week. I, I'll be candid with you. I haven't had an opportunity to review that uh, amendment completely. Uh, but what we want to make sure is that we're not encouraging litigation uh, unnecessarily against insurance companies, because when you have that litigation, there are litigation costs that get factored into the ultimate premium that is passed on to the consumer. Uh, so we obviously don't want that to happen. Uh, James, anything else to highlight on that bill? Um, I, I would just agree with the commissioner that I think there's a lot, a lot in that bill. It's a short, but there, you know, a lot of there's privacy concerns and uh, unintended consequences concerns that re really need to be looked at. Thank you, James. So we'll see how that bill uh, makes its way through the legislature. As I said, it's already changed pretty significantly since it was originally introduced. We'll see what further changes are made as it goes through the House. The last bill in the property and casualty space that concerns us is Senate Bill 462, and that relates to removing the cap on damages for wrongful death loss of consortium claims. As some of you may know who saw our PNC first annual symposium kind of status of the PNC markets forum that we held last month, you know that New Hampshire and many, many other states across the nation are currently working through what we call a hard market. In a hard market is when the demand for a particular coverage is at traditional levels or higher, but access to that coverage is more tight. And so therefore it is harder to get access to. And when you can get access to it, it is more expensive. We are seeing some hardening of markets for certain insurance products in the PNC world here in New Hampshire. What we certainly don't want to do is to make that situation worse. And as you may have noted in that forum, one of the cost drivers for increase in premiums is litigation costs. And so what this bill would seek to do, originally it sought to remove the cap on wrongful death loss of consortium claims entirely. And then the Senate decided that they wanted to maintain a cap, but they wanted to raise it from its current level. So obviously that's an improvement, but we're still greatly concerned. And the reason why is because, you know, insurance companies have to factor in these risks. They have to factor in these costs when they are appropriately underwriting and pricing a product. And so anytime you introduce uncertainty or the chance becomes greater uh, of exposure to risk, the companies are going to appropriately price for that. Then ultimately that cost is going to be borne by the consumer. So we just don't think this is the right way to go. We especially don't think that this is the right way to go right now. And so we're very concerned we hope to have a productive dialogue with the House of Representatives, and hopefully they will choose not to move forward with this bill, at least for this year. James, anything to add? I would just concur. All right, very good. So those are the four highlights that we have for bills pertaining to property and casualty. I'll stop here. Keith, anything more you'd like to add to that? Uh, Commissioner, the other thing I would add relative to the last bill we spoke about, which was uh, Senate Bill 462, the, the cap on wrongful death law, loss of consortium claims. Um, I think you, you hit the nail on the head relative to trying to keep, you know, unanticipated costs down. We don't want to see those making their way to premium. Um, you know, we did look at a, bill, a similar bill, but yet different, uh, that was passed in New York that generated a about 11% premium increase in that particular market. You know, I think even if we would logically assume that, you know, whereas the bills are somewhat different, even an additional 5% uh, premium increase in the hardening market would certainly uh, put some stress where we don't necessarily want it. So little, little numbers behind that, but uh, absolutely, I think we uh, our, our concerns are well-placed. Thank you, Keith. Appreciate it very much. All right, so now we are going to shift over to bills that are dealing in our life and health space. And I will say uh, we have a lot of action going on this session. Uh, it is typically the case that there are more pieces of legislation uh, dealing with life and health and PNC, uh, but this year it has been a lot of action. There's been a lot of action. So we'll start with House Bill 1155, which relates to the, uh, which, excuse me, is relative to insurance coverage for living organ donors. So a little bit more specificity there. The specific type of insurance coverage 
that House Bill 1155 is seeking to deal with is specific to life insurance policies. So as we know, some of the real heroes in our society are our organ donors and particularly our living organ donors. And so what this bill seeks to do is to bring to New Hampshire a national trend, a national effort to ensure that living organ donors not being discriminated against uh, when it comes time for them to purchase a life insurance policy or comes time for them to renew their life insurance policy. So it puts those protections in place so that we ensure that we are not discouraging somebody from becoming a living organ donor. Uh, so that's what that bill seeks to do. I'm pleased that the department was able to play a constructive role in making sure that the language was right where the legislature wanted to be. So I think that bill is in a strong position to become law as it passes from the House over to the Senate. Uh, Andrew, do we have anyone joining us today from our life and health team? Is Michelle on today or am I carrying this on my own, which is fine? I think Michelle is traveling today. All right, very good. Well, I'll carry it on my own. So here we go. Another highlight is Senate Bill 399, which is relative to insurance coverage for blood testing associated with elevated lead levels. So this is another bill that the, uh, the department was very, very involved with. The state of New Hampshire, as many of you may know, has been very, very active in ensuring that we are guarding against uh, lead poisoning, whether that be in the home, whether that be testing in schools. And so this bill seeks to ensure that uh, people are able to get testing for uh, the blood testing for lead poisoning covered appropriately by their insurance company, by their insurance plan. Uh, we have done that. We've helped the legislature get this piece of legislation to the point where it accomplishes that goal. Uh, excitingly, as, um, as part of this effort, we were able to issue a bulletin a couple of months ago uh, that helped to clarify what is currently on the books in terms of protection for people who are seeking this type of testing. So that is now in place. So again, we're pleased of the role that we were able to play in this on behalf of the New Hampshire consumer. And here again, Senate Bill 399 is in strong position to become law as it passes from the Senate over to the House. The next bill that was a big, big project for the department was Senate Bill 411 relative to emergency mental health services for persons 21 years of age or younger. Here again, as many of you know, uh, I've placed a great priority and emphasis on improving New Hampshire's mental health and SUD um, infrastructure, making sure that people have access to good quality care to get their mental health and SUD issues uh, appropriately and effectively addressed. And so what this bill sought to do was to ensure that as new uh, services are coming online, that those services are appropriately lined up to uh, a billing code so that the provider can provide that service, have certainty that that service is going to be appropriately uh, billed. Uh, so to figure out what the billing code is, if, if the service that they're offering, they're not currently in contract with the insurance company for, uh, this process helped them to uh, figure out what services they need to negotiate into their contracts. So it was a big comprehensive effort. Uh, it, it too ultimately led to the department issuing a bulletin that brought a lot of clarity uh, to what services are covered and how they should be appropriately billed. So again, uh, we were able to play a leading role in improving New Hampshire's mental health system, and we're very, very proud of that. The other big project we were involved with was Senate Bill 561 relative to prior authorizations for health care. Uh, again, as many of you know, the topic of prior authorization has been a huge focus over the past couple of years. We obviously want a system that is efficient, that moves quickly, that gets the consumer the appropriate uh, uh, access to care in the appropriate setting. So, you know, prior authorization is a key tool of our managed care system, and it helps to keep costs down and ultimately premiums affordable. That being said, it is a bureaucratic system. And so when you have these bureaucratic systems, you've got to constantly be challenging yourself to understand how you can make those systems better. And so Senator Rashardi, working with a broad group of stakeholders in the department, were able to bring some great reforms to the table around turnaround times, turnaround times for electronic submission of prior authorizations versus the paper submission of prior authorizations, amongst many other things. The federal government came forward with a new federal rule, finalized new federal rule 
as we were going through this process. So we captured a lot of what the federal government was bringing forward, and we accelerated the timelines for implementation here in New Hampshire of those federal requirements. Uh, we're proud of the progress that we've made there. We're proud of the fact that the stakeholders did a great job of working until we were able to reach consensus. So again, that's another big win for the people of New Hampshire. And I'll stop here. Uh, Keith, anything to add on those four items? Yeah, no, sir. Uh, I just echo the hard work that was put in on Senate Bill 411. Um, absolutely, that was a uh, major effort. Awesome. Some other bills that we're looking at that are a bit of concern begin with Senate Bill 354 relative to insurance cost sharing calculations. I call them copay accumulators. Um, we're following this bill very, very carefully uh, for a number of different reasons not the least of which is because of the potential increase in cost that are associated with th this bill. We obviously want important reforms to our health care system. We obviously want uh, productive reforms to uh, how insurance carriers are doing business in New Hampshire. Uh, the problem and the thing that I think is so important for people to bear in mind is one of the most significant barriers to the access uh, to care at the end of the day is cost. And so we're really encouraging the legislature before they move forward with some of these proposals to consider the cost implications. Because again, the insurance companies are not gonna bear that cost. They're not just gonna eat it. They're gonna pass those costs along to the consumer. And what that looks like for the consumer, of course, is higher premiums. And the state of New Hampshire over the past eight years has worked incredibly hard to bring down costs uh, in our, uh, health insurance market, especially in our individual market. And I'm talking about things like the 1332 waiver, working aggressively to uh, increase the pass-through amounts as best as we can. And then obviously the federal government has made additional financial supports available. And the result of those state and federal efforts has been that New Hampshire has the lowest benchmark premium in the Northeast. And that's something that we should be really, really proud of. And it's something that we should work hard to protect. And so our objection to the copay accumulator bill, and again, this bill is highly technical. Uh, you've got to be in that world in some detail to fully understand its implications. And here again, it has gone through a couple of iterations. There have been a couple of amendments. Uh, I think from my perspective, it's still not where it needs to be. And so we're obviously encouraging the House of Representatives to give it a very, very careful look uh, and to ensure that uh, they are striking the proper balance between bringing good reform and ensuring that you're not increasing costs. But the estimation that we have on Senate Bill 354 is that it would add $9 uh, per member per month should this pass. And that might not seem like a lot of money, but I can assure you it is a lot of money. Uh, and so you're going to see upward pressure on premiums if this particular piece of legislation moves forward as it is currently written. So we're going to keep a close eye on that. Along those lines is Senate Bill 555, relative to receipt of pharmaceutical rebates by insurers and pharmacy benefit managers. So put simply, in New Hampshire right now, when you have rebates for prescription drugs, there are two choices that uh, the insurance carrier has. They can either apply those rebates to what we call point of sale which is at the counter at the pharmacy for the consumer uh, to see that they are getting the rebate for, um, for that particular prescription drug, or the carrier can fold those rebates into premiums to help keep premiums down. So the current state, as I said, of affairs here in New Hampshire is that the carriers currently have choice. What this bill would seek to do is to mandate that at, that at least 50% of PBM rebates be applied at point of sale. And again, we have the numbers as to what the uh, cost, we've had an actuary run the cost of the value of those uh, PBM rebates. And so if you take 50% uh, of those rebates and force them at point of sale, it could potentially mean, and, and we don't know this for sure because we don't know how the system is going to account for this, we don't know if they're going to try to sidestep the mandate. We don't know whether or not they'll just eliminate rebates entirely. We don't know how the system's going to react, but potentially you could be seeing $45 million worth of premium pressure uh, come to bear because they're forcing that 45 million out of being worked into premium 
in, into point of sale rebates. And so we're greatly concerned uh, that if you take that choice away, it could potentially have a negative impact. We're following this very carefully. We're looking forward to continuing the discussion in terms of what the precise cost would be for the consumer, uh, it's hard to say because some of the carriers are already uh, putting those uh, the 50% of, pre of, of rebate at point of sale while others are doing something different. So it's hard to pin down a hard and fast number. But again, we want to make sure that as we're approaching this and as the legislature is approaching this, they are aware of the potential cost implications. So that is Senate Bill 555. The next is Senate Bill 407 relative to direct pay for ambulance services. So again, uh, for those of you who have followed our efforts to resolve some challenges going on with our ground ambulance providers, as well as our longstanding commitment to prohibiting balanced billing for ground ambulances, uh, this piece of legislation is uh, somewhat coming out of that discussion. Uh, so what it seeks to do is to ensure that when a, an insurance carrier decides that they're going to pay a balance bill, uh, that that check makes its way to the provider and is not otherwise uh, diverted to the consumer who may or may not know what that check is for, may cash the check, keep the check, throw the check away, and it ultimately results in the provider not getting uh, the remainder of the bill that, um, that they've charged being paid. The trouble with the bill is that it goes farther with that. And so what it does is it allows each individual community uh, to set a, uh, a rate by which they'll be reimbursed, uh, the providers will be reimbursed for ground ambulance services up to, I believe it's 350%. What's that? 325. 325, 325% of Medicare. Um, I'm not sure exactly where that number comes from. We have always encouraged the legislature that if you're going to set a, a set rate, if you're going to have that minimum allowed amount for that reimbursement, that it be based in some sort of <clears throat> actuarial analysis. And I don't think that that was done here. We're greatly concerned that, again, that number is a bit arbitrary. It's going to have upward pressure on premiums. It could result in a patchwork of rates from town to town across the state of New Hampshire. Uh, and most disappointingly for us, it does not prohibit balanced billing to protect the consumer. So there are a number of concerns that we have at Senate Bill 407. And here again, we look forward to really digging in, getting into the details, and hopefully finding a comprehensive compromise uh, with our colleagues in the House of Representatives that we can then take to the Senate and hopefully get some agreement with them as well. So that's Senate Bill 407. Next is Senate Bill 556 relative to insurance reimbursement for health services provided by advanced practice nursed, excuse me, advanced practice registered nurses, APRNs. That's how I always remember them, APRNs. So what this bill is looking to do is to ensure that there is parity in pay between what APRNs are doing when they're doing work that is um, much similar or the same as what a doctor would do. Um, I, I think it's a great idea. Uh, unfortunately, the bill as it is currently written is not workable. There are some mechanical issues that are in the bill that are very challenging. Our team here at the department is looking forward to digging into uh, how we can make this work and work appropriately uh, when, it, when it is uh, scheduled to be heard and taken up by the House. Uh, what I would note, though, is uh, because of our current economy and our current workforce uh, challenges, a lot of our carriers are already reimbursing APRNs at the same rate as doctors for that same work. So uh, fortunately, we're in good shape here in the state of New Hampshire today, regardless of whether or not this bill moves forward. Again, we support the principle. We support the concept. We've just got to make sure that the bill is written appropriately. And last but not least, the Senate Bill 558, relative to insurance coverage for infertility treatments, protection from discrimination during IVF treatments, parental leave, and adoption. And here again, our team has been very, very actively involved with this bill. There are still some issues to be resolved. I know that there is still a great deal of concern uh, amongst uh, carriers here in New Hampshire. Uh, again, we'll keep working at that. We will ensure that um, you know, same-sex couples here in New Hampshire are not being discriminated against. There are not unnecessary barriers in their way as they uh, get uh, into the process of starting a family. So 
again, Bill is not ready for prime time as it stands today, uh, but we're going to keep working on it with the legislature and hopefully come out in a good place, if not this year, then certainly setting it up for success in the future. So here again, I'll stop and see if Keith has anything he'd like to add. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. The one thing I'd like to uh, jump back to is um, Senate Bill 407, which is relative to um, ground ambulance billing and some of the uh, shortfalls we see the, the what the bill's at. Um, in particular, certainly it doesn't address the, the balanced billing issue. <clears throat> um, but, you know, uh, the commissioner mentioned that what really needs to happen here is a deep actuarial analysis of what the reimbursement rates could look like. And um, certainly the department is, is, is ready to take on that function and to support um, that effort. You know, even we have issued a paper or actually a fairly lengthy paper report, which uh, proposed increasing the rates on a temporary basis. I think uh, upwards of 12 to 18 months uh, at about 200% of, of Medicare reimbursement, which would allow us time to do that actuarial analysis. So uh, <clears throat> I think we stand by that still and would love to work with uh, uh, legislators and rule makers so that we can make that happen. Awesome. Uh, before we wrap things up and kind of summarize things and then take some questions, I wanted to circle back uh, to again highlight some of the cost implications associated with some of these pieces of legislation. So going back to Senate Bill 555, and again, that's relative to the uh, receipt of pharmaceutical rebates by insurers and pharmacy benefit managers. Our analysis finds that the cost for that is between $10.84 to $18.81 per member per month. And again, those are really big numbers. They may not seem like big numbers, uh, but they are really, really big numbers. Senate Bill 407, which again is the direct pay for ambulance services. Again, it's the bill that attempts to address the challenges that ground ambulance providers are having. That carries a cost implication of 22 cents to 86 cents per member per month. Again, that seems really small. It may not seem like a large amount of money, but again, it is. It is a significant upward pressure on premiums, which is obviously what we don't want to see. And then Senate Bill 558, the bill relative to uh, infertility treatments, uh, that carries a cost implementation of 90 cents to $2.05 per member per month. So again, that's the analysis as these bills are currently written. Again, we're only at halftime. We're looking forward to continuing the dialogue. We're looking forward to sitting down and going line by line through each of these proposals if necessary and seeing if we can find the appropriate balance between uh, improving our overall healthcare system and access to that healthcare system while not driving up costs for the consumer when they're trying to pay their premiums for their health insurance. So those are the bills that we're focused on. Those are the big highlights. That's what that's what's been keeping us busy here at the department over the course of the last several months. And uh, again, we're looking forward to keeping up that work as we head into the spring. So if I just uh, jump Please. in there, Commissioner, you just went through some of those numbers. I just want to highlight the fact that while each of these bills, um, you know, the the per member per monthly charge may seem, you know, relatively low um, on their individual basis, you know, quick calculation puts us somewhere between 22 and 30 dollars per month. So for a family of four, you can look at approximately 100 dollars per month uh, additional cost. So it's, you know, in the aggregate, these bills will have a substantial uh, impact on premiums. Um, as currently designed and as in the past. So. Mm -hmm. so that is where we stand at the moment. Are there any questions out there? I don't see any questions in the chat window. Uh, I see Carrie Spear has her hand up. Um, you know, please feel free. Oh, here we go. Uh, there's a question here and feel free to type them in the chat window. Uh, can you please list the first two PNC bill numbers that were discussed? Sure, happy to do that. So the first bill was House Bill 1259. Again, that's 1259 relative to property and casualty insurance laws administered by the insurance department. Again, that's our technical bill. That's our house cleaning bill. We're trying to clear out the dead brush, if you will, in our insurance statute, make sure that that statute is current and up to date, that it properly um, cross sections with the appropriate statutes. Uh, ensures that the language and the nomenclature that is in that statute is up to date and again corresponds appropriately to the other provisions of insurance laws. So it's a very technical bill, not very controversial. It's good house cleaning. For those of you who are in industry, I hope that it will make um, 
our statute a little bit clearer, a little bit more comprehensible, uh, make your life a little bit easier. And the second bill was Senate Bill 515. Again, that's Senate Bill 515, and that is relative to consumer guarantee contracts, which again, we've talked a lot about in the past, and there are plenty of materials on our social media platforms and, our, and on our website to talk about those products and some of the issues that we're working through. Okay, and we have another question from a member of the Commerce Committee. Um, for those bills that you have concerns, will you be providing the technical details and the cost details at the hearings? Absolutely, Representative, we will be there. We will have some handouts and at least me, if not uh, me and some members of my team will be there to testify to provide you with all of the information uh, that we think is important for you to know and obviously to answer any questions that you might have. Any other questions, feel free, please type them in the chat box and we can address them here. Or as always, you can reach out to us um, at the department and we're happy to put you in touch with our subject matter experts at any time you have any questions. Um, I see one more, one more hand up here. Um, another representative, uh, Shuet, if you could type your question into the chat window, we can address that for you. Any other questions, please type them into the chat window now and we're happy to address them. OK, well, not seeing any more um, representative, if you want to connect with us directly, please do that. Um, we're happy to chat with you at any time and anyone else that has any questions or concerns about legislation or really any other issues, we're happy to connect with you here at the department. Um, next month on our webinar series, we'll be talking about um, wedding and event insurance and ensuring your vacation or honeymoon. So hopefully you'll join our property and casualty team as we discuss those uh, timely subject matters for this time of year. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. Any final words, commissioners? No, appreciate it very much. As Andrew mentioned, if there are any additional questions, please send them along. We're happy to turn around some answers for you, and we look forward to seeing you all next month. Thank you. Thank you very much, all. We take care. Take care. We appreciate you. Bye now.